The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. Hi there and welcome to the Sonic Society. I'm your host, Jack Ward. David Ald is off visiting his mother, which, you know, I recommend you all do regularly. Not only is it a great opportunity to show your mom that you love her, but it gives you a chance to travel. And traveling is always a good excuse to listen to audio drama. Tonight we have a message to send, or rather, messages. If you haven't heard the General Electric podcast from iTunes, here's your chance for a sneak listen. Every Sunday, this adventure in sound occurs in the feed, and we recommend hardly you take a listen to another example of the new ways audio drama is making a comeback in the internet. Written by Mac Rogers, this series looks into the account of the fictional show Cyphercast. Or is it? And the story about decoding a very special transmission. But without further ado, let's get right into that story with the first three episodes of The Message, right here on the Sonic Society. I'm Nicole Tomalin, and you're listening to Cyphercast. Now... Who wants to hear one of the most highly classified, I'm, I'm talking top secret radio transmissions ever recorded? I know, I know. This is, this is supposed to be Native Tongue, my little linguistics podcast. But Native Tongue is now Cyphercast. Because from now on, I'll be recording it from Cypher. Cypher is a private cryptography firm run by my two heroes in the fields of code breaking and encryption. So, how did I score an internship with my all time idols? And, um, more importantly, what the hell was that about a highly classified transmission? Well, here's what happened. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna take a message. That's Jeanette Callen, one of the brilliant code breakers who works at Cypher. Not someone who should be answering phones. I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just saying if I was there right now, I, I'd be the one taking the message. Uh, okay. So, um, basically, you have a linguistics degree from the University of Chicago, mm-hmm. but you want to make us coffee for free if, what, again? If you let me podcast about the work you guys do. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um... Okay, hold on a sec. At this point, Jeanette puts me on hold for a long time. I, I know it's a Hail Mary. Why would Dr. Robin Lyons and Professor Ty Waldman, two of the nation's foremost code breakers, veterans of the NSA, beloved campus fixtures at Amherst, ever allow me to podcast about their private consulting enterprise? Five minutes pass, then ten... Then, Ms. Tomlin? Nikki's, Nikki's fine. I'm supposed to tell you to take the 120 train to Albany, and someone is going to pick you up from the station. What? Yeah. Okay. I'm also supposed to tell you to bring your recorder. Um, now on the Amtrak from Penn Station to Albany, heading into some pretty hardcore unknown... Those of you who've been with me since July, and God love you, will remember my episode on Ty Waldman and Robin Lyons. I mean, I'm not going to meet them, obviously. (laughs) I'm never going to meet them. Except they are sending a car. There isn't even a receptionist in the cipher lobby. I'm left waiting there for close to half an hour. When I hear a voice behind me. You're the uh, pod person, right? Uh, Or the podcaster, that's you, right? Robin Lyons, executive director of Cypher, and basically the woman I want to be. Yes, but Nikki's working? Mike, yeah, all of it. Yes, Yes. great. Follow me. Okay, yeah. Uh I follow Robin into her office, trying not to drop any of my stuff, and bam. 
there's Ty Waldman just hanging out, just drinking a cup of water like he's not the coolest person ever. I'm freaked out. I think I think maybe 30 seconds pass before I even notice there's another person in the room, an older man in uniform. Am I allowed to give her your name? Lieutenant Colonel Perry Eubanks, ma'am. Uh, nice should to I meet you. Just... Salute? Not necessary. Colonel Eubanks, it turns out, is an old colleague of Robin and Ty's from their NSA days. And just to clarify, Nikki, your recording equipment is live right now, yeah? Yes. Mm-hmm. So, Perry, if you really meant what you said about this being declassified, you won't mind saying it right now. Can we sit down first, or...? Right uh... after you repeat the thing, on the record. The NSA would like to hire Cypher to decode a message we have reason to believe was transmitted by an extraterrestrial. Crazy town, right? Now can we sit down? <coughs> I'll say up front, uh, you wouldn't be the first. A number of internal teams have taken a crack at it since 1945. Uh, you kept this a secret for 70 years? So... It turns out, in all that time, like 200 people connected with the NSA have tried to analyze this message. Colonel Eubanks put me in touch with one of the few guys still living who actually worked with those teams. He's retired warrant officer Ronald Pakai. Pakai is a former signal technician at Station Hypo in Pearl Harbor. And check it out. He actually knew the guy who was on deck the night this bizarre transmission came in. It was just a 19-year-old petty officer who was then stationed at Hypo. On the evening of July 21st, 1945, this kid was simply monitoring wartime communications for Fleet Radio Unit Pacific. You know. Static all day long. The occasional transmission, most of them friendly, boring stuff. And then he hears that. So he was pretty weirded out? Just about shit his pants. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Can you imagine a guy going on an overnight getting hit with, well, we don't really know what it is. Voices, music, breathing. Have you listened to it yet? Not yet. Uh, we're having a discussion about that. Oh, so. yeah. I bet I know what that's about. The curse, right? Hold that thought. We'll come back to that. But let's rewind back to yesterday and Colonel Eubanks dropping that bombshell on Robin and Ty. Why bring this to us now? There's a documentary it's supposed to come out in the fall. Family members from two different decryption teams talking about messages from outer space. The government won't admit their loved ones were paid to translate. But just enough accurate info to make my colleagues uncomfortable. Now, standard practice in my field is deny everything and just wait it out. What I argued was... What's the point of standard practice here? It's, it's 70 years old. What possible security interest are we protecting at this point? Why don't we just release it first and take the wind out of their sails? And they went for that. With every sentence, this sounds more and more like a conversation I shouldn't be hearing. Right, so uh, your basis for legitimately believing this transmission is of extraterrestrial origin is what exactly? An earlier team determined that it met all five of SETI's standards for intelligent life. What? So your basis for trusting their conclusions? That team was led by Lewis Krell. The mention of that name freezes the cup of water to Ty's lips. If we do this, and I'm not saying we are, we do it publicly. Ms. Tomlin here will record it on her podcast so there will be an accessible document of the work we do. You're not going to call my bluff here, Robin, because there's no bluff to call. I'm serious about this. I know it's a weird thing for a guy in my field to say, but I really think that open source is the future. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. right. Thanks, Gary. Well, obviously, before we do anything, we're going to have to check everybody's work. We're going to take it step by step. Right. At this point, Ty goes into his office to review the data that Eubanks left behind. Now, Cypher's not SETI the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, but they can review the NSA's findings to see if they genuinely do meet SETI's standards. With Ty off taking this first stab at this, I take the opportunity to ask Robin. So you guys have 14 years of collaboration under your belt? God, is it that much? 
I mean, that's longer than most marriages last. Well, our actual marriages would probably like to see a bit more of us, but yes, <laughs> it's one of those situations where two colleagues complement each other. It seems like it's working. Well, the money's a little, let's just say, a contract like this, both lucrative and amazing PR, it could really be important for us. As long as it's not tinfoil hat nonsense. Uh. At this point, Ty comes back from the other room, looking very, very quiet. He hands his tablet loaded with Eubanks data to Robin. I don't want to say anything, just read it. As Robin disappears in the adjoining office with the tablet, Ty sits in the kind of silence where there is no right words to break it. I try anyway. Uh, it seems like there must have been, like, at least something in the materials or... Uh, Pretend that for some reason you wanted to know absolutely everything about me, right? Mm -hmm. So, you sneak into my house while I'm at work. And you go through everything. I'm drawers, computers, back of the closet, under the bed, the whole house, inch by inch. And the whole time, you keep looking right past the empty carton of orange juice on the desk in my study. If you notice it at all, you just think, I guess Walman's a slob. But? But what you don't know is that for basically my entire marriage, I've been drinking orange juice straight from the container and putting it back in the fridge. My wife has asked me to stop doing this for literally decades. She is at her wit's end. So this morning, when she finds yet another empty carton in the fridge, she places it prominently on the desk in my study. Now, it'll be nothing to you snooping around my house, but when I next enter my study and see it, it will say things to me that could never be said so powerfully in words, no matter how carefully chosen. Wow. Yeah, if it is real, if this, if this is a real thing, we're not going to be able to crack it through any conventional means. There is going to be a carton of orange juice, it's going to be right in our faces, and we're going to keep staring right through it. So you don't want to do it? That's why I do want to do it. About ten minutes later, Robin comes back in with the same glassy look in her eyes that Ty just had. The two of them deliver a master class in nonverbal communication. They silently agree to call Eubanks together. Are you guys going to make me a happy man or what? All I'm agreeing to is to take it to the team for a more thorough vetting, but uh, just back of the envelope looks promising. And? Provisionally, pending review, we're in. Well, then I am a happy man. How about that? So when can I play it? I'm sorry, is that the podcast lady? Yeah, look, why don't we follow up I with mean, this? Can I play it on my show? Yeah. I mean, this is... Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to that. But I don't get an answer to this question. At least, not today. No one says why, but I've kind of got an idea. This is a bit I didn't play you before from my interview with Ronald Pakai. Have you listened to it yet? Not yet. Uh, we're having a discussion about that. Oh, yeah. I bet I know what that's about. The curse, right? I'm sorry, did did you say the curse? Yeah, yeah, the curse of the message. Nobody's told you about this yet. Um... Well, there's an outside chance that it kills people. For more on this curse, and hopefully the world premiere broadcast of the message itself, join me next week for part two of CypherCast. Welcome back to CypherCast. I'm Nikki Tomalin, and this is part two of this brand spanking new podcast. I'm following a team of top shelf code breakers as they attempt to translate the first ever 
verified message from an extraterrestrial civilization. Now, there's lots of exciting new stuff to share with you, but first, I promise I won't be coy. Yes, you will hear the message in this episode. Right at the end of it, in fact. But by then, you might not want to. Three days ago, Dr. Robin Lyons and Professor Ty Waldman agreed to formally consider the NSA contract to decode slash translate the message. Today, they've called a meeting of the cipher staffers they would assign to the project, if they definitely take it. Podcast. Yeah. Doing a podcast oh, on, on cipher. Wait, they went for that? Right. So, Pioneers, good morning. Have a seat, please. This is serious. It's either a huge opportunity that could put this team on the map or could make us a laughing stock. And if we get a whiff of that, we're out. In the meantime, let's begin. Can I say previously on Cybercast? All right. Please. Please. <laughs> previously on Cybercast, yes. Per Eubanks, NSA, old colleague of me and Robbins, shows up at the end of last week with a freshly declassified recording of a transmission picked up by a Navy signal station in 1945. Originally called Transmission 72145, it never gets a proper designation and ends up being known only as the message. In the last 70 years, five different decryption teams have attempted and failed to determine what, if any statement, the message is trying to convey to its recipients. As Robin correctly points out, we don't want to buy a pig and a poke here, so let's play our game entitled Convince Robin the Message Really Is from an Extraterrestrial. So... SETI proposes five relevant factors to determine if a signal was generated by an extraterrestrial intelligence. Repetition, spectral width, extrasolar origin, metadata, and Terran or earthbound elimination. They've each been assigned to present on one of these topics in the hopes of persuading the unpersuadable Robin. I'm not unpersuadable, I just need more. Remember, this is all secondary sources. We haven't even listened to the message yet. So who had repetition? Jeanette. Yes. And thank you for giving the cushy one to the English major. We met Jeanette Callan briefly last week on the phone. She is Cypher's resident expert in unpacking literary or cultural references in any text they're trying to decode. So, Robin. <clears throat> Repetition is super basic. If the exact same information is being transmitted over and over again in clear, definable iterations, then the odds are that the transmission's artificial. So, I borrowed the use of Tamara's analyzing Wait. software, Wait. and I definitely see, <laughs> and I hope that you can see as well, that the transmission repeats every 28 seconds. Jeanette agreed to speak to me after the meeting about the work she does for Cypher. Like, what are you looking for in this project right now? Well, what I'm looking for in any text is um, any kind of pre-existing cultural information, so, like, literature, music, visual iconography, symbols, anything that has widespread association or traditions. A recognizable cultural reference is, like, a piece of DNA. So, what kind of DNA are we looking at here, specifically? Uh, nothing from this planet, which sort of raises the question of what I'm doing on this gig. Back in the meeting, it was Tamara's turn to sell Robin on spectral width. Now, it wouldn't be surprising if some of you already know who Tamara Wiley is. You've probably heard her name in the news. You know those high-profile hacks lately? She's been developing cutting-edge password systems to prevent them in the future. So a random signal quite often will use up a lot of the radio spectrum. A targeted signal, by definition, will take up less. That's how we make sure every radio station gets its own frequency. And according to this spectrum analyzer, the message comes in at well under 300 hertz standard established by SETI. Meaning something intelligent made it. Not just made it. Targeted it. Excellent, Tara. And for our next trick... Okay, hello, Nikki. Hi. My name is Maud. Maud. Um, so my preferred pronouns are they and them. Hmm. I'm sorry, your preferred pronouns? Just so it doesn't right. get weird later. We oh, honor that in course. this workplace. Of course. Of course. Yes. Almost as much as we honor Maud's forthcoming explanation of extrasolar origin. Um, okay, so I, so I can't really explain it myself, but what I can tell you is how the goofballs I eavesdrop on explain it. It's not hard for me to guess what Maud does for Cypher. 
I'm sure that Robin and Ty need fairly regular access to, let's say, not readily available data, and I'm guessing Maud makes it readily available. Maud spreads out two complex charts in front of Robin. So this one here is from your guy Eubanks, and this one is a comparable simulation of the trajectory of an extrasolar transmission. Do I want to know where this came from? I mean, it's a pretty big deal place, and you know some okay, people just there. Okay, so, all right, we need to confirm that the signal came from outside our solar system. Thank you. I know what extrasolar means. Okay, so as far as I could learn, there is this thing called sidereal time, where you're like basically... Tracking the movement of the Earth relative to the astronomical bodies that aren't the sun. Thanks, Tamara. Okay, so if you can nail down the sidereal travel time of the signal, then plug that figure into a parallax triangulation equation, you can get the ballpark on the point of origin. <laughs> and by ballpark, you mean a really huge amount of space. So, the triangulation your guy gave us for the message ballparks in the M4 Scorpius globular cluster, which is, you know, far. So, I compared that to the simulation from the distinguished place whose name I'm not going to say because you'll get mad, and the process and the numbers match. This is what extra solar looks like. Quick sidebar, not only did I talk to Maud after the meeting, I also made a point of talking to Robin about Maud. Yes, they've been vetted. I oversaw that process myself. And uh, there weren't any red flags? Pages and pages of red flags. But they were the red flags I was looking for. Maud was equally vague when we spoke later. Yeah, I definitely, um, I made some trouble for myself at like a few junctures. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta understand what it's like in the community. It's it's just it's super competitive. So if we all try to pull bigger and bigger stunts, you know. You're talking about like the hacker community oh, or Christ, hacker. black hat. Oh god, you're killing me. Um, okay, so I, I I maybe I just don't know what the current parlance. Oh is, yeah, I don't know. I'm inside it. It's like when you're inside it, it's just like the guys. That's the gender non-specific meaning of guys, by the way. Back in the meeting, Nikki. To do yes, your homework. yes, thank you. Metadata? Um, right, metadata. Um, the idea that a transmission from an intelligent civilization would not only be repeated, but also organized in its presentation. Like how a book has a table of contents and then chapters to correspond with it. Uh, basically, any piece of material that gives you instructions on how to consume it. So wait, so now you're going to tell me that the message has a table of contents? that was new back when we were working on the message. A lot of people in the field kind of rolled their eyes at it. So remember last week when I spoke to that naval signal engineer in Hawaii, Ronald Pakai? Pakai was at Station Hypo when the message was recorded in 1945. And then later, he went on to work directly with the message's most famous failed decoder. That was NSA cryptographer and Ty's personal hero, Louis Krell. Lewis was one of the first people in military cryptography to sign off on the idea of metadata. Now everybody thinks in those terms today. Colonel Eubanks not only cleared Ronald Pakai to speak freely with me about Lewis Krell and the message, he also ordered Station Hypo archives to send any message-related materials to us. So the people down at archives were very kind, and they dug deep into the records and we're able to track down this. Lewis Krell's analysis of the organizational structure of the message. Krell identified a sound heard only at the start and the conclusion of each iteration. A sound that, that doesn't recur at any other point during the transmission. Signifying the beginning and the end. Yeah, I mean, that's what he thought. Which leaves only terror and elimination. That's the biggest thing that could blow up on our faces. Mistaking a signal from this planet for a signal from another doesn't get much more embarrassing than that. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to eliminate any possibility of Earth-based origin. Ronald Pakai cited Terran elimination as one of Lewis Krell's biggest obsessions. He had us reaching out to all these weird 
signal stations and all kinds of far-flung places. Mm-hmm. All these private radio operators, immensely time Because he was afraid that the message was... Afraid that it might turn out to be, I, I don't know, somebody's ham radio left on during dinner somewhere. We interviewed hundreds of former soldiers who worked at transmitting stations during World War II on both sides and listened to hundreds of recordings. Mm -hmm. And nothing sounded like the message? Not even close. How would you make a sound like that? Later, having leafed through the Lewis Krell documents, Robin is now skimming a detailed account of the investigation Pakai described. I want more time with the Krell material. Of course, absolutely. But, assuming we're reading all this data correctly... If the message didn't originate from Earth Mm -hmm. or anywhere in our solar system, Mm -hmm. if it's repetitive, targeted, and organized... Then we're forced to conclude... Aliens, guys. The glee on Ty's face totally infects the room. But I tell the team what Pakai told me. Lewis Krell was one of 29 different code breakers to die while working on the message. They were all under the age of 50, and this was not during wartime. The people making the documentary that started all of this, they're all children of those code breakers. None of them will talk to me, but Pakai remembers Krell's death. So, about the curse, uh, Lewis Krell died pretty suddenly? Respiratory disease, right? And he was the only one at Station Hypo who didn't smoke. <laughs> you know, secondhand wasn't even a thing we were thinking about back then. But then it came up so fast. The lung cancer. Yeah. And uh, then the other two top guys died that same year. Oh. The whole project fell apart pretty fast after that. I got shuffled into some other thing and pretty much quit thinking about it, except every once in a while I'd read a military bit about another code breaker dying young. But you listened to the message. Oh, sure, once. Maybe twice at the outside. But for me, it was need to hear only for comparison's sake. The guys on that team who died were like Lou listened every day. Mm-hmm. But there was that civilian observer, Anders, or whatever his name was, listened to it on a daily basis right next to Lou. And as far as I know, he's led a long and happy life. So, yeah. Intellectually, I know there's no but, courage. Okay, but if I offered you the chance to listen to it right now... Um, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a no. And that's an old man saying no. So take from that what you will. But you know, I'm not going to mess with that thing. Back in the meeting, I've just explained all this to the team. Yeah, but different causes, right? I mean, I'm scrolling through these guys on the death certificate archive right now, and I am seeing liver cancer, I'm seeing heart attack, embolism. Then what are we even talking about? This just kind of sounds like how people die in regular life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, yeah, it's maybe a little statistically weird, but that happened. And this recording is where exactly right I now? It. I have it here on my laptop. What? Damn, dude, fire that shit up. And Ty looks at Robin, and she looks back at him. We're doing this, aren't we? So Robin reaches her hand out to her keyboard and plays the message. And of course, I was there recording, which means I'm about to play it for you. So, same disclosure to you guys that they gave us. 29 people died trying to make sense of the sounds you're about to hear. But that's 29 people out of more than 200 who worked on it over 70 years. So, it's up to you. If that freaks you out, you might want to hit the pause button right now and then delete this podcast. If not, then please sit back, make yourself comfortable, and listen to the first confirmed communication from outer space. It's message time.
what the hell did we just hear? Let's see if we can find out next week on CypherCast. What do you hear? Listen close with me. Is that a voice? Is it more than one voice? Are they speaking? Singing? I think about those wine aficionados who can take a sip and say, That's orange peel, raspberries, tannins. And then I sip the same wine and have to pretend I taste those things. It can be hard to parse out the component parts. But wine's not just for experts. Anyone can drink. And anyone can listen. These sounds were made by intelligent life on another planet. They were sent across the vastness of space to our ears. I'm Nikki Tomlin. Welcome to part three of CypherCast. Man, I wiped the steam off the mirror. And before I can even get an eyeful of my glistening mirror body, this actually occurred. I see reflected in the mirror. The ghost of the alien from the mist. Oh. <laughs> Guys, I'm, I think I'm cursed. I'm going to go do some actual work. This really is Maude, like- Jeanette, and Tamara raiding the lounge for breakfast snacks. It's like a cosmic chain letter. I have to pass it on to one of you in the next five days, or I get probed. All right, I'm really I've got to admit, I want them to like me as much as I like them, but it's hard to break the ice when you're always carrying a microphone. And it's doubly hard when your boss gives you an assignment that seems specifically designed to annoy everyone. Two days after the team meeting where Cypher decided to take on the message, Ty gave me this particular assignment. Ty said what? Um, He told me to bring Jeanette over to your station and document you solving the mystery. What mystery? Um, the mystery of why Jeanette is even working on the message in the first place. I. He said those words, why Jeanette is even... But why you? I mean, why, why is it a big mystery that you would be working on the message? Because there's nothing here for my specialty. I do linguistic and cultural associations, but I don't know the culture of planet Zardox 5 or wherever it is this comes from. I don't know what this message means to whoever lives there. God or... damn it. This is a Ty Weldman mind game, isn't it? It is a Ty Waldman mind game. He and Robin had talked me through their reasoning earlier that morning. Okay, two ways to lead someone to an answer. Straight up hand it to them, or give them the question and make them find the answer. The point of Cypher isn't to create a Ty Waldman vanity boutique. That's just not sustainable. And Ty reaches out and pats her clumsily on the upper arm. She means that I'm not sustainable. (laughs) All that too, old man. So the goal is to cultivate people who think like Ty? Oh, God, no, no, that's just the first step. The goal is they think better than I do. Getting back to the situation with Tamara and Jeanette, I gotta hand it to them. They picked up Ty's challenge pretty fast. Okay, then, fine. If it's mind games, let's play mind games. What are the clues? Well, right off the bat, I think it's something that you and I can work out together, Jeanette. Okay. And it needs to happen specifically at your workstation and not mine. So if Ty wanted us to be at my workstation... Mm-hmm. Well, what are you working on right now? What I always do with audio. Model it, break it down. Tamara scrolls through five different screens that are hooked up to her laptop. Each one highlights a different aspect okay, of so- the sound wave. What are you looking for with all this? Looking for? Mm -hmm. Nothing at this stage. It's more like looking at. Hit the playback. Okay. Uh, I'm never going to get used to that. Now, 
Any complex sound is composed of a mix of audio frequencies. So what's on the screen now is a spectrograph. It's like a map of all the different frequencies contained inside the message. You've got lower frequencies down here at the bottom. Those are the deep sort of bassy sounds you're hearing. And then at the top are the high frequencies, the high pitch sounds. A lot of this is kind of a mess, but here. You can kind of see these sort of shapes and patterns emerging. One thing I'm trying to do is figure out how these different frequency patterns relate to each other. So I've tried to isolate each pattern and I've run them by a couple of colleagues who are a little better versed than I am at this We time. can just talk to people about this? Uh, there's a lady standing talk. right there with a microphone. I'm pretty sure we can talk to whoever we want. You've been listening to that on headphones. So? Okay, I've had a few nightmares. Big deal. But if you're making calls this early on, you think you have something. Maybe. Maybe. If we assume that this works like a human-made recording, I bet that each one of those patterns indicates a different sound source. Multiple things, multiple entities emitting sound all at once. Play it again. What do you hear, Nikki? And here it is. The moment I always dread. The wine connoisseur handing the glass across the table to me, saying, Sip, and tell me what you taste. <laughs> well, I guess... Voices, obviously, right? No, obviously. not obviously. Oh. Never say obviously. But if we're acknowledging that that is an assumption, let's follow it and see where it goes. If they were talking, they wouldn't all be talking at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we talk at the same time every day, every meeting, every brainstorm. Yeah, but not session. for like 30 straight seconds. After 10 seconds, we give each other turns so that we can hear each other. Uh, mostly true. Right? And, no, play it again. But that doesn't happen here. It's multiple voices running concurrently, but not interrupting each other. What does that suggest? Are they singing? Why would you say that? Well, there's just a sort of, like, sing-songy quality to it. Hmm. I think this is multiple voices singing in a kind of call and response. Tamara, I think this is a choir. <gasps> and there it is. Mystery solved. That's why Ty wants you on this project. This conversation perfectly illustrates something Ty said to me earlier. Never squash your silly idea. No, no, at least give it a chance. And some of the best work I did on my whole career came from ideas that at first I was embarrassed to even say out loud. Jeanette has clearly internalized that lesson because she doesn't hesitate. Maybe it's like <laughs> a chant? Maybe part of a ritual? I need to start digging into the whole history of choral music. Oh man, contrapuntal music, call and response. Sure, knock that off by Everything lunch. we've made in our history that's similar. So I can connect the dots and Isn't go back to the if... origin and see if something fills uh, in the gaps. Uh -huh. Sorry. Are you okay? No, I'm... Tamara, what's going on? I'm fine, I just... Tamara, do you want to... some water? Here, let me get you some water. No, I just... Hey, what's going on? Are you okay? <laughs> Hey, sit down. I just need to catch my breath. Did you... Here, have some water. <sighs> I don't think she's okay. Is it a panic attack? Oh, oh my god! Shit. She just hit her... Tamara, are you okay? What is going on? Um, okay, go. Um, I think we... 911 now. Okay. While I'm scrambling to find a phone, Jeanette kneels helplessly over Tamara, who's lying on the ground, breathing like she's dragging the air through honey. I, I, don't, I don't have anything usable recorded after that. I'm taping this about two hours after what you just heard. The paramedics have left with Tamara, with Robin riding along in the back. And I'm... Uh, I guess I'm gonna... I guess I, I don't know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? Um, 
This has been episode three of CypherCast. I really, really hope we'll see you next week. And that's tonight's show. Hope you enjoyed the message. Hope even more you subscribe to find the rest of the story. In the meantime, our message to you is that we hope you're enjoying the upcoming holidays. Please consider sending us a Christmas card in the shape of an iTunes review or by passing the Sonic Society on to another friend of the family at Thanksgiving. Let them know that the Sonic Society showcases brand new radio drama from around the world each and every Tuesday night. On top of that, we produce our own audio drama, and you can find that at Electric Vicuna Productions' website at evicuna.com. That's E-V-I-C-U-N-A dot com. This week, a remake of the amazing Deadline short, Choice, with Josh Price and Crystal Donahue producing. We're midpoint of NaNoWriMo this year. How's your writing coming along? Have you hit the 25,000 mark yet, or are you burned all the way through? Remember, we have our interview Sonic Speaks at the beginning of the month on Sundays, and very shortly, every other Friday, we'll continue our adventures with Biff Straker in the Spaceways as we work with Captain Radio himself, Richard Summers, sitting in the production chair and original music, of course, from the amazing Sharon B. Look for the upcoming remake of Faith, the seventh Deadly Sin and Deadly Series favorite produced by Tanya Malevich and starring the queen of modern audio drama acting herself. Find us and like us on Facebook on the Sonic Society Group, Electric Vicuna Productions Group, or join audio drama radio drama lovers. Send us a message at Twitter at the Sonic Society and please subscribe to our YouTube. Until next week, for David Alt and myself, Jack Ward, I bid you good evening and great listening. Good night. The Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening.